For our experts in emotion interview, we have the honor of speaking with Dr. Jerome Kagan on temperament. Dr. Kagan received his BA from Rutgers, his MA from Harvard, and PhD from Yale. Dr. Kagan is a Daniel and Amy Starch Research Professor of Psychology, Emeritus at Harvard University, and co-faculty at the New England Complex Systems Institute. Dr. Kagan is a pioneer in developmental psychology and demonstrated that an infant's temperament demonstrates remarkable stability over time and is even predictive of certain other behavior patterns way into adolescence. As evidence of his immense contributions to the field of psychology, Dr. Kagan has been listed as the 22nd most eminent psychologist of the 20th century. So with that, I now turn to our experts in emotion interview with, Sir, with Dr. Jerome Kagan on temperament. So welcome, Jerome. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for asking me. I was wondering if we might start out hearing a little bit about what first got you interested in emotion. Sort of where did it start for you? Well, it started when I decided to be a psychologist because <laughs> being interested in development, it is obvious that you have to be concerned with the emotions of children as well as adults because emotions are intrusive. They force you to attend to your environment and yourself. Mm -hmm. And you can't understand human development unless you are profoundly concerned with the emotions of guilt and shame and joy and pride. So you can't separate the problems surrounding emotions from the problems of human development. Mm. And so I'd love to ask you a few questions actually about your work on human development. So you pioneered an entire field of research in understanding human development and putting temperament as a construct on the roadmap for many people, researchers, decades to follow. And so I'd love to hear you tell us what you think are the essential ingredients of temperament, sort of what is temperament exactly? Temperaments are biases you begin life with. Most are inherited and the product of neurochemical biases. As you know, there are over 150 chemicals in our brains and they vary in their concentration and in the receptors for them. So there will be a large number of temperaments. That, uh, that pattern, most of which are inherited, although some can be prenatal, let's say most are inherited. You begin life with them. Those are biases, biases only, for certain feelings, moods, and behaviors. And from the moment you're born, the environment, your social environment, grabs them. Like a painter grabs the pigments on his or her palette and begins to incorporate them into developing beliefs, ideas, habits, and values. And once they get incorporated, then they disappear. I mean, look at a Monet painting of a pond. The individual pigments are hard to see. They're all been incorporated in the painting. So with temperaments, but they're there. And they get woven into personality traits. Now, I could probably, after a day with you, know your personality traits, but I couldn't know your temperaments because they're hidden. They're incorporated. They're like the threads of a tapestry. And they bias you, not determine. They bias you towards certain moods. It's easier or harder to be joyful, easier or harder to feel guilty, easier or harder to be tense, and so on. And that's what temperaments are. Jung made an important distinction between anima and persona. The persona is, are the traits we display to others. Your anima is inside and private and no one knows it. Temperaments contribute to your anima, less to your persona. And so it sounds like, you know, there's a powerful way that temperament can help us understand our emotions by, you said, either biasing us towards or against feeling certain kinds of emotions. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Fantastic. Yeah. I wanted to ask you a little bit also about your work showing that early emotional behavior patterns, even in young infants who are classified as either inhibited or uninhibited, 
can be predictive of these profoundly different behavioral and mental health outcomes even decades later in their lives. What do you see as some of the most important discoveries between these two groups of infants and sort of the different trajectories that led them down later on as adults? The high reactive infants begin with a chemistry that renders their amygdala more excitable than most. And as a result, in the years before school, they appear more timid, shyer, more cautious. But they, those are per, parts of your persona. They're easily overcome if you have the, live in the right oper, uh, circumstances. So by the time you're 18, you don't have to appear shy or timid or cautious anymore. But what is preserved from your early high reactive temperament is anima. You are more easily tense and you know it. You more easily become anxious when there's a deadline and you know it. Although you can hide that from others. One of the most high reactive infants we ever had, very fearful to your own, good family, she conquered uh, all those external traits. She works on Wall Street and if you had lunch with her, you would never suspect that she had the temperament of a high reactive, but she will tell you over lunch that she gets up earlier to make sure the day is planned and those surprises occur. And when an unsuspected challenge occurs, she feels tense, though may not show. It. So that in adulthood, the best predictor of a high reactive temperament is not introversion or shyness or timidity. It's this low threshold for becoming tense in situations where the average person would not become so uncertain or anxious. So that's really interesting. What do you think this tells us about the stability of our emotions over time? Now, notice I said feelings. Mm -hmm. Now, emo most American psychologists, unlike the ancients, they think the emotions are fear, sad, angry, pride, happy. They're, they're not feelings. They're interpretations of feelings, hmm. not feelings. Uh, a high reactive in many cultures would decide that they have a weak heart and not that they're anxious. So we have to separate out emotions, which are private, symbolic interpretations of feeling tones the feeling tones are caused by the temperaments. The temperaments don't cause the emotions. Mm, that's a very important distinction. Yes. And you're right, it's one that people don't make to, as often as they should. We sort of use feelings and emotions as interchangeable words. Exactly. I remember many, many years ago, I woke up one day feeling irritable and tense, and I couldn't decide whether I was tired because I only had five hours sleep, whether I was nervous because I hadn't prepared my income tax and it was three days, due in three days, <laughs> or sad because a friend had died that week. I didn't know what emotion I experienced. So I chose one. What did you choose? <laughs> Those that I didn't have my income tax. <laughs> So among your many research accomplishments, you've also published a book entitled The Second Year, where you take this really provocative look at these, the first or, and second year, importantly, of human life. What, what do you think are the key characteristics, especially of emotion, during this really precocious period? Some people call the terrible twos. The second year yeah. is when humans separate from apes due to fundamental changes in the brain which occur in us but not in any other animal. And what emerges at that time are first the ability to infer the feelings of others. Extremely important. Second, an awareness of your feelings. You're now aware of them. Infants have a sensation of pain, they're not aware of it. Two-year-olds are aware of their pain and because they have language now, especially the concepts of good and bad, they now interpret their feelings. So now shame becomes possible. 
Shame requires you to infer what other people are thinking when you spill milk or fall down. Since one-year-olds can't make that inference, they're incapable of shame. So the second year of life is, as you just pointed out, extremely important for some of the most profound human emotions of shame, a year later guilt, pride, joy, and so on. And so it's this emergence of self-awareness, as you're saying, that gives rise to these, what people refer to as self-conscious emotions, shame, pride, yeah. perhaps embarrassment. Is that right? Uh, self-consciousness and inference. They're not mm -hmm. the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're not the same thing. The ability, mm -hmm. my ability to infer what you are thinking, that's a process separate from mm -hmm. uh, self-consciousness. Mm -hmm. The puzzle, which I and no one else has been able to figure out, is a symbolic language, inference, mm -hmm. uh, self-awareness, and a moral sense all emerge in the second year. They are very different on the surface. Are they due to the same set of brain changes? Mm -hmm. That's a very profound question. I think they share some important changes, but there it well may be that there's some specificity linked to each of them. So you mentioned these profound puzzles that we're still grappling with. And so when you think about where the future of emotion and as it relates to development is headed, wh where do you see it going? How do you see it trying to tackle these age-old puzzles about the human mind? The first thing to do is to set aside the words we use. Set aside fear, sad, angry, disgust. Those are just words we use for conversation. And this is a big task, going to take several decades. We have to gather the correlations among the class of incentive. What is the provocative event that set you up? The brain change that followed that provocation, any feelings that resulted, and how you interpret that feeling. So we got four things. It's a cascade from provocative event to brain change to feeling to interpretation. And now when we look at those clusters as a function of what the provocative event was, Notice by provocative event, I mean in the setting, in the setting in which it occurred. If I spill food alone in my study, I have a different emotion than if I spill food at a restaurant. Okay, so the- Context, as you're saying. The, con the context. Mm -hmm. Now, when we get those correlations, we will then need a new set of constructs, and they will not be contextually naked words like fear, joy, pride, sad, anger. We will have m much more finely differentiated terms. That's the task, and it hasn't begun yet. It's a bold task, but one that sounds like it's absolutely essential to undertake if we're really going to understand what, I guess I shouldn't say the word emotion, um, but what this phenomena is we call feelings, perhaps. Well, okay, we won't understand feelings, but since mm -hmm. feelings are private, and emotions are more public, I would rather say, here's the domain. How do we understand the varied interpretations people impose on their feelings across age, culture, ethnicity? Hmm. That's the task. So when you set these tasks out, I can imagine future students or scholars of emotion wanting to know, well, what can they do to try to answer some of these puzzles? So what advice would you have for future students, scholars, or just the general public who's interested in trying to understand more about this mysterious field um, of emotion? The next cohorts of, of young investigators mm -hmm. first have to learn about the brain. I think everyone understands it. They, they really have to understand how you measure the brain and what those measurements mean and keep up to date on that. Second, they have to perfect new psychological procedures, laboratory procedures that can uh, be a better measure of what thoughts are going on in the person and to go back to behavior film behaviors and examine them for the correlations between the event, the brain change, and the interpretation, and set aside for the moment the words people use. At the moment, the problem is we, just, we have two camps. One camp just studies the brain and assumes that if you see a brain change, there's an emotion. 
And the other group just asks people what they're feeling. Well, both of those approaches are obviously insufficient. And so the new, the next group of young, bright graduate students and professionals like yourself have to look at the cascade. Provocative event, brain change, interpretation of feeling, and then and behavior, and now see what those clusters look like. That's exactly what the Genome Project is doing. It's looking at clusters of genes called haplotypes, right? And they're making great progress. And if you ask geneticists, is this difficult to find these haplotypes, these correlations among gene clusters? They'd say it's very difficult. So I think psychologists have to be prepared for a very difficult, challenging, but in the end, very satisfying mission. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today, Jerome. Um, this concludes our Expert in Emotion interview series with Dr. Jerome Kagan from Harvard University.